Hi, uh, I'm Stephanie Laser. I am the worldwide head of publisher ad tech at AWS. And today I am super excited to talk about my favorite subject, which is ad tech, and talk about how our customers have used AWS to help accelerate their business. First up, NBC Universal is going to talk a little bit about the modern ad TV ad buying platform that they built on AWS. And then Freewheel is going to come out, and they're going to talk about how they accelerated their data and analytics platforms using AWS Graviton-based instances and other cloud capabilities. First, introducing Ryan McConville from NBCU. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you to everyone at the Amazon team for, for having us here. Um, let me get my, my clicker ready. Uh, good to see everybody. So um, I imagine most of you are familiar, or at least somewhat familiar, with NBC Universal as a brand, uh, whether you watch the Today Show or Meet the Press, uh, one of our broadcast channels, E, uh, Oxygen, one of our cable channels, or uh, stream anything on Peacock. Uh, you're also probably familiar with our theme parks and our movie studio. NBC Universal is also part of the Comcast family. Uh, that includes Freewheel, which you'll hear from in a minute. Uh, and Freewheel is very much a part of our advertising technology stack, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, and Comcast also owns Sky. So you put all those three pieces together, it's a, it's a massive, massive media, uh, global media company. And we reach, we touch about a billion people throughout the globe every month, including about 230 million in the US alone through our media assets. Um, what you may not know as much about is the ad platform that sits sort of at the center of all that content. Um, and it's become increasingly complex as our business has become increasingly complex. So the TV business started out as, well, the TV business. Uh, and so there was a broadcast channel and then there were cable channels, but that was still what we kind of, what we call the linear business, which is, you know, a stream of video and ads like um, um, shot out through a coaxial cable into a cable box where everyone is sort of seeing the same content at the same time and seeing the same ads at the same time, no matter, no matter where you live. Um, then digital was introduced, and we started um, you know, uh, uh, showing different shows on the internet, uh, on mobile apps, and then eventually, obviously today, on streaming. The result of that is that we now distribute our content through about 300 unique digital endpoints. Um, and I've, we've tried to kind of visualize them here, but you, know, you, may, you may watch the Today Show on a traditional cable box, but you also may watch it on a streaming app. You also may watch it on a streaming app owned by us, like Peacock, but you also may watch NBC Universal content through a streaming app not owned by us, like Tube TV, or Hulu, or Sling. If you put all of those things together, there's all these different endpoints where you can consume um, NBC Universal content. In fact, you know, some of you might, may watch SNL live on television, others of you may just watch the clips of it on YouTube on the internet the day after. All of this, in order to power advertising, we need to put all of these endpoints on a single ad decisioning engine and be able to help advertisers find their audiences wherever they are. And that it used to be a lot easier because they were all sort of just in their living room watching traditional television. But now they might be on a phone, they might be on a computer, they might be on a streaming device. And so we've had to build what we call one platform, which is the central ad tech platform that helps marketers find their audiences wherever they are throughout this ecosystem. Um, like I said, this wasn't always the case. And though it comes with challenges, I think it also comes with some really big opportunities. So for marketers for a long time, um, they, had, they had kind of this choice, or we think of it as a choice. They had the world of big tech, um, which they could engage with in advertising. I think of these sort of as the social platforms like the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world. Um, all, the, the technology was very advanced because they were digitally native. They had a lot of first party data. They had built proprietary technology. Everything was highly automated. So you could be a small or medium sized business and you could log on to Facebook ad manager and just start buying advertising. Um, and they were also very outcome-based in their measurement. So if you advertise with Instagram or YouTube, you know, you would expect to be able to track things like website visitors or app downloads, like real-time measurement outcomes. But the content on those platforms tended to be user-generated, which has historically had, you know, some issues. Uh, and also the, the actual format is sort of what we call, think of as small screen. So it's, it's, it's primarily mobile-based, not exclusively mobile-based. 
On the big media side, historically, you kind of had the flip of that. You had this incredible premium content experience, and increasingly on bigger and bigger television screens that are sides of the, like movie screens in our living rooms, 70-inch TVs. But the technology had gotten a little bit outdated. So we weren't using big data. We were using mostly these small data panels. Um, you know, think about like the traditional Nielsen-based panels, 20,000-person panels to like, extrapolate audiences. Um, the process for buying television was very manual, so a lot of small businesses weren't really able to do it. Um, and then the measurement was pretty traditional. It's just sort of GRP, like reach and frequency, but you weren't really getting things like website visits and app downloads. With the advent of streaming and the digitization of the overall TV ecosystem, as I explained earlier in this new distribution model, um, all of that's changing, and these worlds are really coming together. So when we talk about one platform, we, we talk about that as TV modernized. It's the first global video platform to combine the kind of best of both of those worlds, the big tech world and the big media world. You get the professionally produced, culturally defining content. And I'll give you an example right now. We have the, the World Cup running on Peacock, and it's programmatically ena enabled with biddable media. So the trade desk at DSP is able to bid into that environment and buy ads in real time uh, during, the, during the World Cup. Those types of things never existed before. Um, so you're getting all the benefits of big tech, the big data, the precision uh, targeting, the automated buying in combination with the premium video on those really big screens. But to fully take advantage of this, you know, publishers like ourselves and marketers have had to change in, 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 in three really big ways that correspond with the ad tech stack, which Amazon is helping us power, which I'll talk about in a second. The three categories that we, that we think about the most are one, audiences, so moving from what we call small data to big data, so moving from panel-based demos, right, like I, I want to reach women 18 to 49 or adults 35 plus, to I want to reach in-market car buyers. I want to use big data sets. I want to use my CRM file, and I want to target just those users. That's one big change that's coming to you know, the, the modernized TV business. The second big change in, is in activation and automation. Um, still today, a lot of media buyers want to plan and buy linear and digital separately. So they'll, they'll have a linear, a linear plan, right, that they're buying traditional TV shows, and then they'll have a digital plan where they're essentially buying the same shows on like a Peacock, but they're, 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 they're pricing them not as units, they're pricing them as impressions, they're thinking about it in a completely separate way, when it really is not separate anymore. 97% of the consumption of our content happens on a television screen. And the average consumer doesn't realize if there's a digital ad server sitting behind that television screen or a traditional linear technology stack. Um, so we're trying, to get pe we're trying to get media buyers to really plan holistically across one platform. Try to find your audience regardless of whether, whether they're consuming it through a streaming platform or traditional TV platform. Um, with that also is the automation of buying. We can now automate the buying through uh, DSPs and through TV APIs that can make it more self-serve and can democratize access to from our customers. Uh, and then the third and final category is measurement. Moving from this panel-based uh, approach to measurement where you're just measuring reach and GRPs to, again, to start to measure real outcomes, uh, business outcomes, including website visits and app downloads and store visits, et cetera, et cetera. So NBCU has three product suites that essentially correspond with this. Uh, I won't go deep into each of these, but our NBC Unified platform is our data and identity platform. We are now collecting first-party data, logged-in data, from our Peacock universe, from our streaming TV universe, uh, and from our theme parks, uh, from our other businesses like Fandango. This is, you know, this is very much like a, um, well, an Amazon Prime. I'll use that as an example. So you, know, you have your Amazon Prime account that sort of plugs you into the Amazon ecosystem. Now you have an NBC Universal you know, account that you sign up with us, and we're able to use that identity through, throughout, like, throughout our platform. And we're able to use that for, for targeting and onboarding of data. So that's our data management platform. From there, we're able to find audiences that marketers want to reach, and we're able to optimize media plans using our AdSmart platform. And that's a platform that takes the identity seed and then finds where those users are throughout our media ecosystem. And then third and finally, we have our, our new measurement products. And that uses big data, the ad exposures and the identity data associated with who saw those ads, and delivers those um, using Amazon technology uh, to our measurement partners so that they can perform more accurate, precise, deterministic measurement. 
Uh, and this is not, you know, not something brand new. We've been working on, uh, on, on the um, components of one platform since 2016. We were actually the first media company to launch data-driven linear, which uses big uh, data, set-top box data, to find precision audiences within television. In 2016 and 2017, we started automating the business. We were one of the first to make premium CTV uh, and premium video available uh, via uh, biddable media, via PMP. And we were also launched TV APIs to allow our linear business to be planned in an automated way. Um, in 2018 through 2020, we really started focusing on cross-platform. So we uh, introduced the first cross-platform measurement system. It was built off of Nielsen. Um, we call it um, uh, it's, it's part of our, what we call our C-suite uh, offering, um, but it, it combines Nielsen digital measurement and linear measurement to create a cross-platform measurement. And we also created our first cross-platform planning system, so you could build a media plan across linear and digital at the same time. And then lastly, in the last couple of years, 21 and 22, um, we have uh, launched our first clean rooms. We've built our data management platform because we're starting to use more first-party data uh, and needing to make that interoperable with our partners for onboarding of data and, 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 and offboarding of data for targeting and measurement. But we need to do it in a very privacy compliant way. Um, so uh, so we've, we've started to uh, build a, an entire cloud-based clean room infrastructure uh, for data interoperability. Um, so my last slide before I, I turn it over to, uh, to my, my colleague here is just a quick snapshot of, of the one platform tech stack. Um, I'll try to take this uh, through in a, in a pretty logical way, just starting on the, the left-hand side. Um, this, is, this is sort of the new modernized way to, plot, to, 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 to plan and buy television. That, that's sort of the, 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 uh, the, I guess, the overview of it. So instead of using a, you know, a traditional demo target like women 18 to 49, we have connected our data platform, which collects our first-party data with our marketing partners. So you see the agency and customer data. We're able to onboard their CRM files or their customer data and match it to our first party data. Again, typically through clean rooms and privacy compliant cloud-based solutions. We then take that match, that seed file, and we push it into our activation in order, like our, basically our planning platform, which is AdSmart, which we're gonna, which we're gonna talk about today. And that's where we build the media plan to find those audiences wherever they are across TV, digital, and also our partnership distribution endpoints. Those are things like YouTube and, uh, and Hulu, as I, as I said. We then activate and the plan optimizes across all of those endpoints to find those users. And the ad exposures that, that, um, that are accumulated through that ad campaign are delivered into the cloud, into our audience insights hub. That's uh, it's an a a Amazon back backend. Um, where all of that data is stored are as run logs or digital ad exposure logs. And then those are delivered to measurement companies to score uh, how that campaign performed. And those measurement companies may have data on checkout data or foot traffic data, which they can line up with those exposures to then see the people that saw these ads, did they eventually go and take an action? And that's sort of how the new infrastructure works. It's all built on the cloud. It's data in on the left side, data out on the right side. Uh, all through these cloud-based data inter interoperability um, technologies that we'll talk about today. Um, where we're gonna hone in today is really in these two places where Amazon has been incredibly helpful. Um, one, on the optimization front, helping us build the modernized TV and really cross-platform planning systems. Uh, and then two, on our data infrastructure, where we're able to land data and then make it interoperable um, uh, through privacy, uh, privacy compliant technologies with third parties for measurement. Um, and to take you through in, in a deeper way, I will introduce um, uh, my colleague, uh, Jeff Bernard, who is the SVP of Ad Technology at NBC. Thank you, Ryan. Wow, that's a lot of complexity and a lot of data. Um, you know, like Ryan talked about, we've been working on the modernization of TV since 2016 with the um, the original advanced advertising group that I came in to start. And we've been you know, partnering with Amazon ever since. Um, the, the ad tech technology team uh, was always on-prem up until 2016, and we took a leap to say what we needed to do in terms of the, the start of modernization of TV and to capture the tumultuous you know, change from linear to digital, the explosion in digital, we had to look at the problem differently. And so we brought in new technologists to be able to do that. 
Um, I've, got, I've got two vignettes we're gonna go through. One's gonna be the green field where we talk about building these platforms out that Ryan had talked about. And the second one, more the transformation of the existing ad sales technology data stack where we went from on-prem and into the cloud and really partnered deeply with uh, Amazon to be able to get to where we are and, and get to our clean room vision of uh, data sharing, democratization um, with internal and external clients. So I think you know, we, we've talked about the challenge um, that we've gotten into. Um, in 2016, we started really getting into big data. We started getting set-top box data, some of the impression data from Freewheel. That pivoted us into the cloud. And then we had to develop with uh, Amazon, how are we going to basically compute, manage, and process that data effectively and efficiently to be able to make these optimized media plans to be able to capture the, the monetization. When we started, um, the systems were, were different, as Ryan had said. There's a digital system and there's a linear system, and that's where the buying platforms came in. Um, as we look at where we are today, we've got a, a cohesive system that we're building in terms of the one platform where we have opportunities come in and we manage the portfolio plan of how we're gonna refactor this into linear and digital buying patterns that's obfuscated from the buyer or the planners that are out there. And then on top of that, as we talk about additional complexities, uh, Ryan alluded to new currency sets. So Nielsen was the currency base for uh, TV since 1962. Uh, we have currently embarked on doing uh, alternate currency uh, vendors. So we've got iSpot as real-time data, big data sets coming in through these pipelines. So we've worked with Amazon to be able to reformat these data pipelining um, activities for this big data, synthesize it into our forecasting across linear and digital to be able to help with our planning across uh, these holistic media plans that are going on. as we get into the big data journey. Uh, so that's a lot of the operational systems. So we really had to think, how are we gonna think in the cloud to be able to create these planning, monetization, and trafficking systems, the one platform. The other problem that we had was as we move all this data from on-prem into the cloud, there was a different way that we needed to think. We were HDFS on-prem, we were Teradata on-prem. Um, we look at where we were coming from in 2019. We were running out of data center space. We were running out of processing power. Um, we were constrained in terms, of, although we had a large footprint, we were constrained in terms of special events. And there was something coming up in uh, the summer of 2020, which was the Olympics. And we always see explosive growth uh, every Olympics, and we'll, we'll show that in a little while. Um, which was gonna blow out our capacity in our data center. So we had, a, we had an immovable object in terms of the Olympics. We also had our data center closing in um, the, the Q2 of 2020. So we embarked in, in uh, the summer of 19 with Amazon to say, how are we gonna move out in one step from on-prem into the cloud, think about data in a new way, in new paradigms that are gonna be flexible and efficient and cost-effective for us to be able to run everything that we needed. Um, and, and that's where we got to. So we partnered deeply with Amazon. Uh, we had well-architected solutions with them in meetings, weekly check-ins, event plannings, um, cost optimization reviews, and, and really continuing to, to uh, move down that path. The timelines that we had, we had the proposal um, uh, validated and approved to go at the end of August. We worked through uh, with our teams in Amazon. We were out of uh, the data center in April, a uh, little prod parallel, ready for the Olympics, but then kind of COVID happened, the Olympics shifted. Uh, we looked at where we were at that point in time and we had met our uh, projections in terms of uh, our cost models in the cloud compared to on-prem. So one of the things that we did before embarking on this was saying, how can we take a 10-year view of where our cost model is for on-prem and the cloud and do it in a cost-effective way? And we were able to do that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
So what we were able to do in terms of cost savings, we were able to realize a 40% cost savings going into the cloud. Usually people think about big data, you think about big paychecks when you go into the cloud. Uh, but we were able to model out and, and get to a cost effective way. Once we deployed into the cloud, uh, and we, we had that and then the Olympics moved, we spent another six months doing additional cost optimization to be able to make the infrastructure um, as performant in terms of uh, query speed as in cost. And we'll talk about some of those techniques. So, you know, our, our big data is, is fairly large, you know, four petabyte, petabytes total. Our biggest fact uh, data uh, table with um, our digital data is a 380 billion row fact table, 14 dimensions. Uh, so a lot of data in there that we had to, to work on. Um, some of the optimizations that, that we did and we've actually patented, um, we, 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 first of all, we used everything in terms of ephemer, uh, ephemeral uh, computing. And during the night processing all this data, we have around 200 jobs. We spawn around 8,000 servers to process this data overnight. We use spot fleet instances. We patented uh, our ability to um, determine a machine equivalency matrix. So per each job, what would it take for large machines, medium machines, small machines? And then we looked at the historic spot pricing. We put some machine learning on that. And then we could calculate out what these clusters would cost. And so as we execute these individual jobs, each one is tailored to a particular cluster and cost model and sequence out the run throughout the evening. And, and our largest um, cluster that we run up is I think 64 R512s um, that, that run for 70 minutes processing the, the big data set that we get from Freewheel that we're gonna hear a little bit more uh, afterwards. But we, we had those two patents in there and that was really able to, again, manage the cost structures in a way that allows us to be extremely flexible to do the things that we needed to do for the business. Part of what we wanted to do in going into the cloud was to be agile, be reactive to the business needs. Uh, and, and as we looked at moving into 2021, after we did the cost optimizations, we had two big initiatives that really tested our theory of whether we did it right the alternate currency that we talked about, which was really ripping out this, or at, ripping out and adding the currency backbone into the operational planning systems, and to be able to um, instantiate our audience insights hub or our clean room approach that we'll talk about in a second. Um, we, we also, I think one of the, the key points that uh, I, I failed to mention in the last uh, slide, we have a metadata driven infrastructure. And that was very interesting when we came down to the Olympics and, and, and going, because sometimes you, you have some failure rates in the spot instances. We um, were adverse to trying to have that during the Olympics, that marquee event. And we, um, we basically changed the configuration on one line command and went from uh, spot to um, on demand. Gonna go back for a second. Where's my Olympics one? I think I lost track of myself. Ah, uh, the Olympics one. Look at the digital growth in here. Uh, when we started out in London, 100 terabytes. Um, in the games for Tokyo, seven gigabytes uh, of data that was collected in that 17 uh, day period. Our reporting requirements for the business used to be 10.30 in the morning. We got to real time this year in the cloud in a cost effective way. That allowed the business to analyze day over day uh, how we were delivering, how we were moving through the Olympics, and how to manage or redirect some of the buying patterns that we needed across the ecosystem. Uh, so I think, you know, we one could not have done that on prem, we would have uh, incurred a huge cost to be able to get to server power to be able to do that in any on-prem environment. We will do it in AWS in a very cost-effective way and provide the business real time at data that is exponentially um, increasing year over year. That's a little complicated for right now. 
<laughs> where we're heading, data as a service. So you know, we talked about at the, at the end of 2020, we wanted to focus more on, on the business, get 100% of our time. We talked about the clean rooms, we talked about uh, alternate currency, and we're really heading to data as a service, which is the backbone of our clean room strategy. And our, our vision, we've got three planes that are out there. It's, it's storage, compute, and, and access. It's all metadata driven of how those planes access within the data planes to be able to uh, move and process the data at scale. Um, and, and the main concepts that we're working on right now is canonical data, and that is data that is in a form that we publish that can be supported for external or internal clients. This is the basis of our approach to the clean room. And so we're working on uh, these canonical data sets, how we institutionalize the uh, IP and the knowledge of the transforms into shapes that are supported, and it becomes the backbone for our data as a service offering. It, within our clean room approach, we have foundational layers of data management, the construction of the canonical shapes, and then we look at clean room technologies such as AWS's clean rooms, Snowflake, Infosum as being endpoints. So within our data ecosystem, we've already curated the correct set of, of sizing for um, the data, the canonical shapes, that then we just do the last mile push into the clean room technology. We're clean room technology agnostic, so we wanted to do a lot of it under the covers to be able to deal with the management aspects in that cost-effective way, and then hit the endpoint that the advertiser or the agency wanted. This way we give them flexibility, we're not tying anyone in. And uh, we're, we're continuing our paths with uh, the AWS Clean Rooms uh, team and looking forward to more of that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff and Ryan. We love hearing about how AWS operates with massive scale. And for more on that, uh, Shen Yu Huang is going to come up from Freewheel. Thank you. Um, I'm Shen Yu Huang from Freewheel. And I think I will build on top of Jeff and Ryan's uh, presentation and actually dive a uh, few layers deeper and uh, share some story uh, about Freewell and our journey uh, building on and migrate to, free, uh, migrate to uh, AWS. So a few words about Freewell. Um, as Jeff and Ryan mentioned, we're, part of, we're also part of Comcast, and particularly Comcast Advertising. And what, what we are, we serve ads. And we serve ads particularly for, uh, in premium co video content. And so, you know, NBCU is one of our largest customer, and along with all the other names that highlight here, uh, household names, in aggregate, uh, we really serve 90 plus percent of the uh, uh, top media companies in the US, and also in Europe. We have Sky here. Um, so, Freebo started in 2007. Um, just a year after AWS started. So as you can imagine, when we start building our infrastructure, uh, everything was on-prem. And uh, it wasn't until 2016 or so, uh, we start really migrating uh, our infrastructure and all the services to AWS. And, and uh, so, I want to provide uh, some numbers to highlight the scale of our current infrastructure on AWS uh, per second, per day, and every year, the, the scale of requests, the volume of data that we're dealing with, and on a constant basis. And on top of this, really, um, like Jeff's presentation, the Olympic chart showed, um, we constantly see uh, year over year two to three times increase on the uh, incoming request side. That's where we are, 1.2 million. And probably by the end of the year or early next year, we're gonna approach 1.5. And on data side, even more. Um, it's more than, sometimes we see four, four, four X to six X increase year over year. And because of different partner, uh, different partner integration coming in, in some area we actually see 10 X increase uh, on the data side. So, 
you know, with some hard work and also by leveraging con the constant advancement on AWS services, we were able to deal with these uh, leaps and bounds pretty smoothly. And more importantly, with predictable costs and in some cases, uh, flat cost or even saving, which uh, is the story I'm gonna share and dive deeper. Um, so my first story is uh, focusing on how do we migrate our workflow uh, onto Graviton instances and uh, to really accomplish do more faster but for less. Before I dive, uh, dive into the details, uh, I want to share um, some rough number, just give, give people a sense of the scale of our compute infrastructure on AWS. Billions of compute hours, tens of millions of instance launches every year. Beyond that, um, live event. So Super Bowl every year, Olympics, and uh, early this year, the, the Winter Olympics in Beijing. And right now, even right now, as we speak, running the uh, advertising, uh, serving advertise uh, in the, uh, 20, to the Qatar Worldwide, uh, uh, FIFA World Cup. By the way, go, go US. First time. Um, and what's special about this is during the live event, things can become very unpredictable. And uh, we actually do see from one second to the next, the uh, incoming request volume really increased 100%. Maybe somebody scored or something happened. And, and you know, one second to another, 100 times uh, increase, but uh, overall it's still uh, 20, 30 times larger than we typically have to handle. So how do we do that? Um, yeah, of course, there's some magic. But magic is more on the planning side, meaning you, know, you can't pull 10x increase on, the, uh, on your launched EC2 instance. Someday, may, some, someday that might happen. AWS we're probably working on that. But during the planning, having different options that we can actually use different de density uh, different, uh, different density uh, and different capacity uh, of EC2 instance, particularly with Graviton coming into the picture, that really give us more leverage and more flexibility in terms, in terms of planning. How do we reserve additional resources to anticipate these increases? And so I want to start my story with conclusion and then dive deeper, see how, we, uh, how do we get there. So as you can see, um, the cost saving and the efficiency is absolutely there. It's definitely there. This is based on uh, the portion of workflow that we have, mi we have already migrated. And also, you know, looking at the number is pretty spe spectacular. If you remember last slide, billions of computing hours, if you're talking about 20% 20, 20 uh, decrease on cost, that's millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. So really spectacular, sorry. Next, I want to dive into uh, five specific areas that we learned um, that in our journey uh, that really help you to do the right thing and achieve the right result. The first one, it sounds pretty simple, test, measure, analyze, and decide. So test, obviously you start with testing, making sure your current workflow work exactly the same uh, as you migrate from one instance type to another. So to do that, having a, having a, smooth, uh, having a smooth CDCI pipeline, uh, the, the, the enough coverage on your unit test, integration test, that's definitely critical. That get, let you get to the result pretty quickly. But more importantly, it also allow you to collect data around performance and overlay that with, with the cost data, that's really the analysis all about. Uh, making sure on performance side you achieve what you want to achieve, but also on the cost side, you're not blowing up, blowing up your budget, either flat or decrease. So that's really, um, I want to dive a little bit deeper on the test. So I, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned test your workflow for sure. Uh, but in some other use cases, to fully understand the characteristics of different Graviton instance types, you know, sometimes we also use um, 
uh, we, in some cases, we use, you also use standard test suites to really understand and dive really deep on the performance and cost benefit or characteristics. So here, as an example, this is actually one of the tests we did um, using TPCH, uh, the test case, as a test case. And uh, you can particularly see uh, what query runs faster by how much, which one is slower. And also another aspect here to highlight here, uh, highlight here is uh, uh, different density give you additional option. For instance, the uh, at the bottom is really the, the Graviton instance where we have, nine, uh, we have eight cores as opposed to the nine core in the regular EC2 instance. So higher density give you fewer nodes. And you can see both on the performance side, the second to the elapsed time on that column, uh, you can clearly see and quantify the performance gain while based on the compute hour, you can really get a sense of what kind of saving on the cost you can have. So very important. And based on really making data-driven decisions um, and uh, do this against your workflow uh, uh, using standard test suites to get a full picture. That's really important first step. Next one, um, really upgrade and upgrade end-to-end. -end. Obviously, you need to upgrade your uh, compiler uh, or at least change your compiler. Um, and if you're a Java shop, uh, virtual machine upgrade, that's pretty critical. So here, uh, I want to share um, an example, uh, the standard JDK versus the uh, AWS supported JDK different deployment. You can see under the same condition how they, behavior, how they behave and what kind of performance you gain you can have. So that's on the compiler. Oh, by the way, also, uh, you know, if you, are Go, if you use Go, um, we, uh, the, the most recent upgrade we had, I believe it's 1.18, um, clearly show additional 10 to 15% performance increase for us. So be thorough. Um, upgrade your compiler, upgrade your environment. But last but not least, don't forget about your shared library and all the dependencies, because they're in the picture as well. Um, speaking of up, upgrade dependency, that brings up to another um, point. We try to avoid bifurcation. Uh, when I said bifurcation, you know, um, in some cases, maybe you can't, uh, you, uh, you know, Graviton instance is not option. For instance, if you have mixed on-prem and uh, uh, in the cloud infrastructure or workflow, you might not be able to do that. Um, we try to stick to Say, if we upgrade one workflow, we do that end-to-end -end without incurring additional effort to say, I have, I have to manage two pipelines, I have to manage two code bases. It sounds pretty simple, but you, know, you have to think, you don't want to save a dollar on the operation, but uh, have to spend another $1.5 on additional development and maintenance resources. So that's, that's the full picture. And uh, so far, uh, we've been focusing on just if we upgrade, it's end-to-end, -end, and that has proven to be a very helpful strategy here. Really simplified a lot of things. So um, this, again, might sound obvious, but we actually, um, uh, early, earlier, we actually run into uh, issues when we're trying to do the production deployment. Uh, it's during the deployment we realize, oh, crap. There's not enough instance in this region. I'm sure AWS is working on that, and the thing's constantly improving. But um, since we run into this issue and we have to roll all the way back uh, end to end for our production uh, deployment, I think I, I want to mention this uh, as something you want to check prior to you pull, pulling the trigger. Talk to your TM, uh, talk to your account manager, and uh, run your test. Make sure they're there. Simple but important. Now, now you're deployed. It's not the, uh, we think it's not the end of the, uh, the whole cycle or the journey yet. Again, I'm going back to uh, measure, test, and analyze. Really, measure, look at your P99 charts. Make sure you get what you get, uh, what you anticipate to get. For instance, like what we're, show, what we're showing here. And uh, also, constantly overlay, uh, constantly overlay your cost factor into, uh, into the picture so that you can really see on one side, is it flat, 
on cost side, is it flat or decreasing, but making sure on performance side you get what you, uh, what you anticipate. So on, on, on the screen here, uh, I purposely removed the labels, but what it is is a, a daily aggregate computing, compute hours uh, for one of our pop, uh, pipeline uh, workflow. Um, you can clearly see, which is really what you want to see, uh, before and after the deployment, um, the step change. In this particular case, a 30% 30% saving in, um, uh, in com daily compute hours really show the benefit. And, you know, talking about test, um, AWS continuously, uh, continuously released different uh, instance type. I understand two days ago or the day before in the keynote, um, there's new instance type coming, uh, coming on board, um, becoming available for ML workflow. So definitely, Keep your, keep, keep your eyes open and uh, continue, uh, continue to test your, uh, uh, your workflow and uh, align that with the, uh, the new advancement in AWS and um, really understand what you can get, what potential you can get. Yep, that's uh, the end of the story. Coming back to where we started, really, the saving is there. Uh, I'm sure on, on, on that side, uh, your finance team, your CFO, CFO will be happy. But on the performance side, that definitely make your team proud, but more importantly, make your customer happier. So it's a good story and it's a good journey. Definitely we're doing, uh, doing more uh, in 2023 based on the success we have seen and had uh, in 2022. So I run through this pretty quickly. Um, I think we, we're gonna finish ahead of the time. Uh, last story, um, Again, going back to store, uh, storage, uh, this is the area where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing uh, even more, uh, even more excellent uh, growth and uh, faster growth. So how, how do you actually uh, flatten your storage cost curve while data keep coming in? Again, I, I want to sh first start with the uh, this is actually uh, a, screen a screenshot from one of our uh, operation dashboard. Um, the bottom one is indicating the volume, and this is a quarter. So within a quarter, it's a straight line up increase about 30%, which translates to about you know, 12, two to three times, 2.5 times uh, increase year over year. Um, and the blue line here is the great good news. It's relatively flat. So how, how, how do we do this? Um, you know, earlier we actually in, invest uh, our resources um, to actually really trying to analyze our uh, data usage pattern and actually active, proactively moving things around, uh, moving things around from hot, hot storage to cold storage. But again, I might be, uh, by doing so, I might be saving money on the, on the op side, but uh, op, uh, uh, operation costs, but uh, I'm, I have to invest a lot more um, human resource, basically developer resource, actually constantly enhancing, constantly maintaining this infrastructure. So net-net, you know, you're not really gaining anything. And uh, using AWS term, that's really undifferentiated heavy lifting. And what happened? It's pretty simple, actually. Um, relatively pretty simple. Um, the S3 intelligence tier, tearing storage class. That really helped. Uh, that instantly took the uh, heavy lifting out of uh, my team in this particular case. Particularly when we actually reach 80% coverage, we really start seeing the, the curve flattened. And guess what? Since we don't have to do that, what we can further do is invest our res uh, development resource, really focusing on uh, optimizing the data, whether it's cleaning up the junk data, making sure data going in in the right format, optimize the uh, uh, data schema to, in, to optimize the data size, and also you know data and retention policy, really do the right thing. But you know having uh, having that AWS service coming in to help really allow us to focus on what matters to the business. And um, I thought that's a good story to share with everybody here. Um, on this one. On this one, I want to take this opportunity to say, hey, what do we see that can be further improved uh, in this case? You know, 
we noticed this when you know one of our marketing team say, "Hey, um, I, there's a there's a there's a metrics we don't have," which is true. And I just need to, for for marketing purposes, I want to run a long term report that goes back to the raw data and the calculated uh, metrics. Guess what happened? For the next 45 days, I have to carry a, lo a lot more costs than normal because uh, tons of long-term raw data get pulled from cold storage to hot. Um, ideally, if we can have, uh, have an option, more flexibility to control how data, uh, the, the, basically the, the time period between uh, the boom, boom movement, right now I believe it's, uh, it's a fix 45 or 90 days, I can't remember exactly which one, but it's a fix. So in this case, if we have more flexibility, that would be great, that would be great. But still, love the service and uh, really help us to keep the cost curve down. So very quickly, that's actually uh, my two uh, story to share. And um, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today, and I hope you have a great rest of your reInvent. If you have any questions for NBC, if you have any questions for Free Will, um, you can gather up in the back and, and have a conversation. All right. Thank you all.